Hello, good morning everyone. Um, welcome again to my YouTube channel and this is probably going to be the last video of the school year. Um, I think we all deserve a break. We're very close to the end of the school year so I propose that we make a pause till um, September. Um, this session is, a, is going to be about ways to support language learners in class. Working in international environments makes that we systematically and regularly receive new students into our classrooms. Students that have um, um, different mother tongues and that English or whichever language is the target language of the school becomes an extra challenge. So I do have other sessions in the channel about uh, the fact that we're all language learners, but I would like to um, focus on certain strategies that we could use to support language learners in our classroom. Um, a couple of discussions to have first, and, and is the one, a, a debate about to what extent babies learn more or faster, or they're more able to learn languages than adults. Um, and I, I don't want to go into a, a conversation. I don't want to, to argue about that. We all have different perspectives, theories, ideas. I can tell about my personal experience as a bilingual person or as a multilingual person and, and my children as well. Uh, and I do have the feeling that um, babies or, or, or young people have a tendency, not maybe to learn faster, but to better understand and acquire the sounds of languages. So the, the, the earlier you learn a language in your life, the, the more chances you have to speak as you were or as that language was your mother tongue. So in any case, what um, uh, research says is that early childhood is the best possible time to learn a second language. Um, and also the fact that children that experience two languages or more from birth uh, typically become native speakers of both, while adults struggle with the second language learning uh, if they want to reach native like fluency. It's very, very hard at adult age to get to have the sound uh, of, the, of the words and the pronunciation correctly as it was your mother tongue. Um, another thing that we need to take into consideration is the fact that in many parts of the world, being bilingual is, is the norm rather than an exception. Um, I don't know where you come from, I come from Spain, and I can tell you that being bilingual in Spain is not a norm at all. It is pretty much an exception. Uh, but if you look in particular to northern countries, um, bilingual is absolutely normal, and something has to happen in those countries that makes a difference. Maybe it's because movies are not translated, maybe it's because since the beginning schools teach two languages at the same time. Um, there might be an answer to this. Um, I would try to think that it's probably because of the immersion that um, babies, um, the consequence of immersion that they have in those countries where everything is in two languages. Um, it is also a fact that babies have a better ear for different sounds, but are very bad at explicit learning. Uh, explicit learning is pretty much the one that we uh, um, imitate in classrooms, is it? Uh, so the lack of cognitive abilities makes that babies make it, but find it more difficult, uh, the explicit learning. But, however, they are much better at implicit learning, so at imitating. And this is the way in which babies they learn, by imitating the sounds of the parents. Um, now, how do babies learn a language? Is there a specific process? This is one of my proposals, my, 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 my visions of it. They first learn sounds uh, by experiencing. So those sounds are what we call phonemes. Um, and by they do, they, they're being exposed to them as a natural communication process with their parents. So what we should do with these babies in terms of learning sounds is speak to them. Because by speaking, they can repeat those phonemes that they hear from us. The second step is that they learn words. So they give meaning to the sounds that they've learned before. Uh, this is called morphemes. So what we have to do when they're in this moment in their life is to read to them. Why am I talking about this? Because we're going to try to, to mirror these into classrooms. And finally, what the babies do is that they learn sentences. So they speak. So what we need to do uh, for these uh, children when they're at this stage is to give them the chance to speak without interrupting them. Even if they are saying um, a wrong words, so the pronunciation is not correct, or the sentences are not correct, but we need to give them the time to speak. So can we, in one way or the other, mirror this process 
into the classrooms, learning sounds, then words, then sentences. Let's think about that. Um, Tankage, in, in, in one interesting website and blog, uh, the theory says that in order to learn a language, is, that it's crucial to have an emotional bond with it. And what this person says is that if you, if you find like-minded people, that makes it more likely that you'll push on with the language and that you'll persevere. So can we, at some point, include this emotional bond into our classroom? What can we do for the students to understand or to find this personal link um, with the language? So that will definitely engage them and motivate them to learn the language better. So how can we translate all these ideas into our classroom? So I'm going to talk about one main um, tip and then I'm going to mention the second one. The first thing we need to do is to cultivate relationships with the students and with their culture. We need to be culturally aware of their differences, their sounds, their language, their origin, their culture. So could we, as an example, have, for example, in class, a small, very small library with books that represent all the mother tongues that are included in the class? Can we ask each one of our students to share their culture, their language, their reality, how they say this word in your language, how they say this word in our language. So just have a session where you can interact and each student can share their own culture. Another tip is making language skills explicit across the curriculum. And if you want to know how, there are some tips in a previous session that I've recorded called We Are All Language Teachers. Uh, in there, I share a lot of strategies, some ideas, or how can we all become language teachers? Uh, and, and that created some kind of a confusion among, among some people. It's not that we don't teach our subject anymore and we take the role of a language teacher, not at all. It's the fact that by teaching our language, uh, sorry, our subject, we teach our subject using as a tool the language. So this is the reason why I say that we are all language teachers, isn't it? Another one is using what we call productive language. Productive language is to invite students to write and speak, to produce, to create, to have an outcome, a product by using the language. And I think there's a great, great idea called translanguaging um, uh, based on the theories of Owen Crisfield. And on the resources at the end of this session, of this, this little session, I have put the website to this very interesting uh, um, um, ideas that Owen Crisfield um, shares. Um, another one is, is, is give time. Give time for answers. So every time we ask a question to those language learners, we need to give them the time to reflect, to think about their answers, and then to be able to say something. And that is crucial as well, giving them the time. Speaking slowly, uh, which is something that I'm not used to do yet, but I need to work on that, to be honest, but speaking slowly, uh, and give them time then to the language learners to understand what you say. That might be um, um, also by giving a vocabulary lists of, of things, of a list of terms that they will need to understand that particular session or that particular lesson. Then incorporate the student's native language. How can we integrate the native language of the students in our classrooms? And again, that leads perfectly well to this idea of translanguaging that I'm going just to present later on from Owen Crisfield. And finally, using something called QSSSA. So what is this QSSSA technique? Something that I came across with in a very interesting blog that you, can, you, you have just there, uh, the, the origin of the source. Uh, this blog is very interesting, which is basically a strategy to engage students in academic conversations. This infographic comes also from this blog, um, that's Valentina uh, um, uh, blog. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to just use one slide when I'm going to go through each one of these steps. So questioning, signal, stems, share and assess. And what do we do in each one of the steps if you want to develop this QSSSA strategy with our language learners? And I invite you to do it in, in your next class. So 
what is it? And again, you, you have the source just down there of that, that extraordinary blog. The first thing is to, 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 to provoke the students with a question. And the question will ideally be an open-ended question and, and an essential question. And I invite you to look at all the sessions that I've recorded called Essential Questions, which proposes ideas of how to ask questions that lead to something uh, uh, to our students. So those questions should be questions thought-provoking, um, questions that could lead to the topic that we're teaching, questions that can have some specific vocabulary integrated the vocabulary that the students will need to know for the topic. Then based on the question, you will just need to tell the students to give you a response, a physical response about the question. Thumbs up, hands up, standing up, whatever you want. But give a sign up based on that question to see if they're ready to answer that question. Then you will provide students with a STEM. And, and the STEM can, can, can be something like uh, um, from this picture I see, or in this visual I understand, or the message of this visual is. So you're giving those STEM that you invite students to follow that structure where they're going to give an answer. So if the STEM provides also the possibility of being repetitive. And through this repetition, students will get used to give an answer following a structure, a precise structure. And then it will be the time for sharing, where students will share their answers in their preferred format. It can be in a collaborative forum, it can be in a brainstorming, it can be in a Socratic way. It's up to you to decide. And finally, based on that sharing, it's time for you to assess. And we're not going to go in depth about how to assess. It can be just in a formative way by giving feedback. It can be in a summative way. It will depend on when this QSSSA activity has been implemented. So a very interesting topic, very interesting tip, sorry, that uh, I've tried, it works. For me, the challenge of this is to try to create a question which is open-ended and that can lead to a reflection process. The other one uh, is the idea of translanguaging, and that comes from Ewan Crisfield, and I have to uh, apologize now, just because I did record the session of translanguaging, and for whatever reason, I forgot to uh, um, to acknowledge the source. Uh, it's not usual, because as you can probably see in all my sessions, I do make reference to the sources that I've been using, and I will do the same thing at the end of this session. So translanguaging is a very, very interesting idea proposed by Owen Crisfield. Uh, from Crisfield Educational Consulting, and this is the website that I invite, I strongly invite to go and have a look at these extraordinary theories. Um, so the idea of translanguaging, I'm going to do very quickly, very quickly. If you want to know more, again, I invite you to go to this um, to this website. It's the idea of playing with the input, with the process, and with the output. So how to integrate the mother tongue of the students into your classroom. And I'm going to use just a, a, a real example that I did use in class. I teach history and we were talking about the civil rights with my grade 10 students. And while talking about the civil rights, I wanted them to do a little, create an infographic about the March on Washington of 1963. Uh, and using the I have a dream speech and some sources that I was giving them in terms of website or in terms of written sources. I do have in my class three students who are language learners, two of them French speakers, one lady being a Russian speaker. So what I did is I give to the class the I have a dream speech, the bit that I wanted them to, to, to listen to or to read in English. And I gave to the French speakers the same bit in French and to the Russian student the same thing in Russian. So the input, the, the text given to the students was in their mother tongue. I proposed them to work in collaboration, the two French, the Russian of Fortuna, she was working on her own because she's the only Russian speaker, and the other students were working in groups of two or three, and then to discuss in whichever language they wanted, be in French, be in Russian, be in English. The only uh, aspect is that the infographic, the outcome must be in English. So at the end, by doing that, the French speakers, I was able to work with them, um, I saw how their thinking process was going in French, as well as the reading of the source. But at the end, by using a dictionary, by using, by collaborating between both of them, with my support, with the vocabulary list that I was given, uh, they were able to present an infographic which was short in words, 
uh, and lots of visuals in there in the target language with, which was English. I think the, the, the outcome was interesting because it was not very much language heavy. It was at the level of the students and the expectation was for them not only to understand the hidden message and the capacity to show ideas through an infographic, but also to develop and to improve a little bit their English by having to translate sentences and trying to find the right word to define what they wanted to say. So that was a very interesting activity that I'm, I'm, I'm planning to do more often. I know it's a little bit demanding because you need to look for sources in a language that you might not understand um, and, then, and then use them in class, but that, that worked quite well. So again, go back to Owen Criscoe's uh, website, very interesting ideas about how to support your language learners. And these are the resources that I've been using in this session. One about is, is an article on Edutopia. The other one is this, again, Chris Phil, um, educational consultant, uh, consulting, sorry, about the idea of translanguaging and the blog about the, uh, the other tip that I will share with you of QSSSA. So I hope you found this session useful and, and please feel free to share with me your impressions and your, your, your doubts. Um, as always, I wish you all a very, very happy and relaxing summer break, and I hope to have you back um, in this uh, YouTube channel back in August. Thank you very much.